Good afternoon. Welcome today to today's Friends of Cancer Research virtual meeting entitled Future and Focus, Digital Pathology and Oncology Drug Development. This meeting brings together experts to discuss opportunities for the use of digital pathology alongside artificial intelligence and machine learning and drug development. While this field of computational pathology is not necessarily new, recent data demonstrates its important and expanding role in many aspects of the future of cancer research and care. Just one example is the case of antibody drug conjugates. This growing modality is enabling the delivery of highly potent treatments directly to selected molecular targets. The use of digital pathology tools is providing new ways to help identify patients likely to benefit from these advanced targeted treatments. I want to thank all of our expert working group members who have been meeting over the past several months to develop the white paper you should have received in advance of today's meeting. Today, we look forward to a discussion of the complexity and opportunities associated with computational pathology in new drug development. We hope this will be an interactive meeting for everyone online, so please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will relay questions to the panel. The slides for today's presentation as well as the meeting white paper will be available in the chat and on our website. To kick off today's meeting, I'm pleased to introduce J. Carl Barrett from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for a presentation on patient selection and oncology drug development in the role of digital pathology. Carl is a leader in our field and has been integral to this project. Thank you for being with us today, Carl, and I'll now turn things over to you. Hello, I'm Carl Barrett, and I'm very pleased today to introduce the, the Friends of Cancer Research uh, panel on digital pathology and oncology drug development. These are my disclosures. Let's start by going back in time a little bit about the, when pathology really got started in 1876 with the development of h and &E staining by Wyskowski. This methodology hasn't changed much in the ensuing 125 years. Uh, it is used uh, routinely today to really uh, diagnose almost every cancer for which there is a tissue based uh, a, a tissue based uh, available. Immunohistochemistry became uh, developed in 1941, but it really became quite well used in the early 90s. And it was in 1998 that the Hercept test was FDA approved for Herceptin, which really introduced the field of precision medicine um, that we're in today. In the last decade, um, molecular pathology became quite commonly used with the development of NGS uh, in 2010 and the approval of the first companion diagnostic in 2017. If we look then to where we are today, the um, field of digital pathology is emerging quite rapidly. It had um, the, its first step with the pathologist equivalent image analysis in 2015, but it was really the first digital scanner authorized by the FDA in 2017 that really made a difference. And then in 2019 to 20, digital pathology image, image viewers uh, were, declared, were cleared. Uh, this is why we think that the next transformative technology to enable patient selection and clinical outcome is going to be digital pathology. Realize that the vast majority of clinical tests that are done at, with um, cancer patients are pathology-based, 94% of the pathology-based, and only 6% um, uh, only are genomic-based. So this is digital pathology and pathology assessment is quite important. The evidence for the growing enthusiasm of digital pathology is evident by a, a couple of factors. One, the increased publications of uh, in digital pathology, where there was an increase with the digital pathology scanners being introduced. And then COVID uh, led to actually a 30% increase in digital pathology use as it became very important for pathologists to work uh, remotely. That in turn has led to a proliferation of both uh, e the developers of systems, scanners, et cetera, uh, as well as AI um, algorithms in the field. So this is a very active area of, of research and commercial development today. 
a number of use cases that have been demonstrated using AI with both H&E as well as IHC as well as Multiplex IF. And this is another reason for the great enthusiasm and potential of these methodologies. Here are a few examples of digital pathology from H&E, including staging and prognostic uh, predictions where one gets reduced time and reader variability, quantitative measurements of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, um, which is a very good prognostic factor for a number of, number of cancers. There's an open source application for that. And then there's uh, ERPR predictions, PDL1 prediction, nuclear features, which are in increasingly important. And then interestingly, cancer genomics, actually predicting MSI, KRAS, et cetera, from H&E is an area of great uh, interest uh, currently. And then last but not least is the development of response markers for IO and chemotherapy you know, in this field, which I think is important. IHC has become also increasingly dependent upon uh, I AI. Cell proliferation rates can be measured much better using AI methodologies than simply pathologist scoring. Uh, there are pathology aids for standing uh, 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 companion diagnostics such as PDL1. IO responses and PDL1 algorithms can be improved using uh, algorithms and AI. And a really important advance is the ability to turn IHC from a semi quantitative into a quantitative measure using quantitative continuous scoring as methodologies developed by AstraZeneca and by LUNIT. Multiplex IF is probably the area of greatest intensity right now. It enables quantitative measurements on a per cell basis of from a few to thousands of markers. Uh, it's intensive data requiring AI interpretation. It's a very powerful way to measure immune contexture and predict uh, outcome, much superior to IHC, singleplex IHC uh, markers. And it really gives one great insights into the spatial heterogeneity of cancers, which we all know is important. I think the future is clearly the combination of H&E with high-plex immunofluorescence and spatial transcriptomics, which are important tools in research, uh, but also in clinical practice going forward. The relevance of AI and pathology for the pathologist is quite clear. It actually can increase the quality. It could also in, in decrease the workload and, and streamline the processes. The hope is that this will lead to improved diagnosis and faster results and better treatment for the patients as well. Now, we turn us to looking at using a digital pathology for drug discovery. Uh, there are a number of applications across a different uh, spectrum of drug development from target discovery to clinical trial um, uh, predictive marker and prognostic for markers. Uh, we're able to understand the complexity of cancer networks. We can assess tumor heterogeneity. Interestingly, we can look beyond the tumor cell. Genomics usually focused on the tumor cell, but there's a lot of important information in both the, the tumor microenvironment, but also the tumor matrix and stroma cells, which are picked up and identified by AI features that are not, um, not picked up by the pathologist. Now, one important next step in, in digital pathology is to go from what David Rim calls reading to measuring. Usually pathologists read slides and they give you their interpretation, but it's much more difficult for them to measure quantitatively uh, features within, uh, within a section uh, or, or IHC. This is becoming increasingly uh, relevant to HER2 testing. So as we move from HER2 high versus HER2 low to looking at um, HER2 ultra low patients, it's increasingly difficult to distinguish IHC 1 plus from IHC 0 by the pathologist who cannot not measure accurately uh, the low faint staining and actually score uh, the percent cells positive. And the methodologies of quantitative continuous scoring using IHC will become quite important in this, in this arena, as well as other ADCs and other uh, diagnostic um, um, techniques. Now, what are the challenges in digital pathology and AI? Uh, oftentimes, they require very large data sets. 
uh, data quality can be um, lacking. Uh, data quantity is, is absolutely essential. Uh, interestingly, the page AI approval for pathology uh, prostate uh, detection uh, required 10,000 different uh, patient samples to actually build the algorithm, and the algorithm got better and better with more and more samples. So quantity of data is important. Cohort diversity is also important. There are studies showing that uh, algorithms to predict a response in, um, in Caucasian patients is different than in uh, African-American patients with prostate cancer, and these differences in the stroma of these different patient populations was not appreciated until um, the AI tools actually called that out. To hold these large data sets, uh, it's essential that we move to data, data sharing. Uh, in radiology, there's a federated learning system where people can share radiology images, and the hope is that that will become the case for digital pathology as well. Data standards could be very important, and then obviously moving from just simply having an algorithm that you do not understand the, the basis for to having what's called interpretable AI or causal AI is going to be very important to ensure the uptake of these methodologies. We need to integrate data, um, not only the molecular data with the pathology data, but also with the clinical outcome data and other, other um, uh, features of the patient. Uh, so multimodal data becomes a data management system problem, uh, and I think that's a key uh, next step. The FDA approval uh, is important in these, as these, these algorithms which are being used in RUO settings now and even in some clinical labs. Uh, but it's the one of the challenge is that many of the machine learning uh, algorithms are indeed learning over time, and the uh, FDA uh, seeks to have locked algorithms. Now, fortunately, the FDA has published just recently uh, a discussion paper on using AI in drug development that discusses a lot of these challenges and how one can actually change the model uh, over time with improvement. Also, there is a necessary for FDA approval, an end-to-end in -end the diagnostics of the scanner, as well as the algorithm and the viewer, are all parts of the diagnostic system, and those all have to be um, validated and cleared uh, you know, by the FDA. Uh, this is a slide kindly provided to me by Hassani Madison, which is a summary of the FDA guidance that was just published on using AI and, and drug development including the clinical trial requirement, patient selection, dose optimization, data collection, and clinical trials. Uh, so I encourage people to review this uh, paper. It's really a very rich discussion paper, and it is really the basis for a lot of progress going forward. Today, we're going to talk about the Friends of Cancer Research white paper, um, and the white paper, which has been distributed, um, actually had several objectives to characterize the current and future uses of digital pathology, to identify the challenges in current drug and uh, diagnostic co-development, and then to provide um, uh, proposals to facilitate robust uh, development and computational tools in drug development. And there were two major um, proposal. One was to have an uh, input and performance standards uh, characteristics to allow for optimal transparency, transparency and comparison between different methodologies. Uh, the Friends of Cancer Research has done this and other with other biomarkers such as pdl one testing, TMB testing, and circulating tumor DNA. And, and this, I think, is a really great example of uh, how they can influence the field. And then secondly, the proposal is to provide a risk classification framework for how one actually the evidence one needs um, for um, performance characteristics based upon the intended use. Just let me end with a quote from my, my friend and, and mentor, Gunter Schmidt, uh, who is the AI expert at AstraZeneca, when talking about companion pathology, path, companion pathology, which is a combination of image analysis and AI, uh, Gunther likes to say it's beyond what the pathologist can see and beyond what the brain can compute. And I think that summarizes it very well. I look forward now to the discussion of the panel, but let me first thank a few people 
who helped me, one of my colleagues at, at AstraZeneca, including Hadassah Sate and Gunther, um, my colleagues at Path AI, Andy Beck and Asani, Dave Wilbur and Michael uh, at Clarissa and Linden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl, for that presentation to set the stage for today's discussions. Now, I'd like to introduce Kimmery Kulig from Kulig Consultings and My Biomarker Navigator as the moderator for today's panel discussion. As a reminder to the audience, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for the panel. Kimmery, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you, Carl, for setting, setting us up so nicely for our panel discussion today. It's really my honor to be the moderator of today's session, representing the large working group who contributed to our final white paper. But I, I, I'd especially like to acknowledge and thank Brittany McKelvey from Friends who did an extraordinary job bringing us together, keeping us focused, synthesizing our comments and iterating on the mini drafts of the white paper. So thank you, Brittany, for your excellent leadership on this project. We have a representative group of a uh, sample of the working group uh, here today with us, and I'll go ahead and introduce each of them to you. First, we have Megan Doyle, who is the Director of Global Regulatory and R&D Policy at Amgen Oncology. Brandon Gallus is a mathematician in the research arm of the Center for Devices at the FDA. Joe Leonards is Medical Director of the Center for Integrated Diagnostics at Massachusetts General Hospital. Michael Montalto is Chief Scientific Officer at PATH AI. And Martin Stumpe is Chief of AI at Tempest Labs, Inc. I'll go ahead and ask the panel a few questions and I'll save some time at the end for questions that you submit online. So in the white paper, we highlight opportunities to use digital or computational pathology and AI and machine learning across the entire drug development spectrum. I'm personally excited about its potential for to infer tumor biomarkers for precision therapy and clinical trial enrollment. Where do each of you see the greatest promise for the use of computational pathology platforms? Megan, we'll start with you. Thanks, Kimmery, and of course, thanks to friends for inviting me here today. It's really great to be here with all of you. I think we see the most promise for these platforms in pre-screening and screening of patients, both for clinical trials and clinical practice. So patient screening to enrich for biomarker positive patient enrollment in clinical trials, and even patient selection for use as a companion diagnostic, for example. And the key here from our perspective is that multiple biomarkers could be evaluated using a single H&E slide, as Carl kind of alluded to in his talk. And therefore, we can apply multiple different algorithms to look for those multiple biomarkers. So this would be tissue sparing, obviously, which is great, but also faster and more efficient than the current method of screening using multiple IHC and NGS assays to direct the patient to the right therapeutic or the right trial. So that's why we think these tools hold great promise from the drug developer perspective. You want us to just keep going, Kimberly? No, I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. I'm happy to. And again, yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this. And um, it really is an honor to be here. Uh, so I, I echo what Megan is saying. I think that the white paper and the work that we've done, I think one of the greatest things about computational and digital and AI pathology is the broad. Uh, applications that it does have across the entire spectrum of drug development, which makes it in many ways somewhat unique uh, from a platform perspective. Um, and I think Carl did a great job in sort of outlining them. I'll just give us maybe a shout out plug to one area, uh, particularly around pharmacodynamics in the early space where uh, we have struggled and uh, oftentimes with trying to understand whether or not a drug works or not. Uh, and it's one thing to look for signal and efficacy, but oftentimes we don't have a lot of patient sample in those early trials. We do have pre and post biopsy, and we're just asking the question, has the drug had any sort of meaningful biological effect? Oftentimes in the IO space, we were looking very intently at the TME, uh, and that's virtually impossible to do with standard manual pathology in a sort of a quantitative way with such small samples and the noise uh, that's provided uh, in, in today's approaches. So uh, I think that digital and computational pathology have a, a great promise in the early space, uh, just from simple 
PD measurements to see whether or not we're seeing any drug effect. Uh, but I, again, I'm bullish on every application, but that's just one you know I'll talk about here. Great, thanks, Mike. Martin? Yeah, from my side, first of all, also, thanks a lot for having us, really great panel. Um, I would I see the the advances or advantages of and promises of AI generally in 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 uh, in being able to better measure what we have. So Carl already alluded to that in the great presentation. So really going from reading to measuring, and that's that's an ability that uh, obviously AI can can lend. And what we've seen over and over in a lot of studies uh, that look at the combination of AI and the human is that AI can complement what humans can do pretty well. And you typically get the best of both words if you combine them. So we've seen that in studies that look at you know, metastasis detection, where humans typically are bad at detecting, you know, finding the needle in the haystack. The machine learning is good at that. And then the human can lend the context expertise to it. We see it in counting where humans are bad. And those are all applications or types of, I guess, challenges where uh, computers are typically good at. Humans are maybe less good. But once you combine the two, that's the best of both worlds, both in clinical applications and in biomarkers. And in general, I think the, um, the the second the second part, which in my opinion, in particular in digital pathology, uh, is is a great area of promise, is to identify also, as Kai was already saying, uh, what the human eye or human brain really kind of compute or cannot see. So really identifying subtle trends, patterns in tumor microenvironment that give rise to biomarker discovery, doing more fine grained, let's say, uh, prostate prognostication, for instance, gleason grading, things like that, where human have a pretty crude understanding uh, of the morphology and the features. And we can basically move to a human crude understanding of really data-driven features and get more quantitative and also to discover new science with them. Great. Thank you, Martin. Joe? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I think the, the greatest promise uh, for digital pathology and computational pathology is that we're actually closing a very important gap. And that is that it is the last missing element of the electronic medical health record. If you imagine all the downstream things that derive, for example, from a diagnosis of cancer, the fact that this in digital form element is missing is to me a very foundational gap. And, and working from the drug development perspective towards closing that gap is enabling a ton of other secondary gains, for example, remote work, you know, distant consultations. Once you have this access, you can put um, artificial intelligence on top of it. So very simply put, I think the greatest promise is, of course, having access to the data and then hopefully um, having them available in an interoperable format so that you can gain all the secondary use cases that we uh, love and outlined in the white paper. Thank you. And Brandon? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here with uh, all these great people and working on that white paper was a, a wonderful experience. And to be honest, I don't know if I have much to add on the promise because I'm at, I'm learning a lot of the different ways that AI can be used to support drug development um, and uh, to make studies more efficient and, and more targeted. So it's been fun to hear all that stuff. And just for context, I'm in the Center for, uh, for Devices and Radiological Health versus the, uh, the Center for Drugs and uh, so just so that everyone understands that my answers are kind of um, from that perspective. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll keep picking on you, Brandon. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, so obviously great, great promise, great hope, uh, a lot of excitement about this. But Brandon, can you please comment on some of the key challenges that may be impacting the uptake of these platforms, including their use in clinical trials? Yeah, I think the challenges are something I'm much more aware of, at least because uh, I see it in my in my work here in the Center for Devices. And one of the keys is inertia. You know, inertia, uh, industry likes the path forward to be very clear. And so we really need uh, innovative and rigorous leaders and first movers to, to work in larger groups, multi-stakeholder groups and consortia so that um, proposals can be made research can be done and, and maybe engaging with the FDA to get feedback on, 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 on ideas and proposals for study designs and strategies. Um, and then to share that experience so that everyone can, uh, um, the whole pre-competitive space can learn and, and the whole process and, uh, can be improved. Um, another challenge I, I, I encounter all the time is uh, quantitation. Um, 
and, and the different platforms are, are measuring the same thing, but they are sometimes using different scales of reporting. And that leads to a lot of confusion for users uh, who have different platforms trying to use one platform to make decisions that were really designed for thresholds of a, of a different platform. And so if we could get to um, uh, be more quantitative, uh, like I heard uh, Dr. Barrett talk about, um, and measure the actual things with units uh, so that it's something that we can study across platforms and have standards for, um, for understanding what those outputs mean and be able to compare them. Great. Um, Megan, did you want to add anything to, to that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I completely see Brandon's point that sometimes drug developers want things mapped out very clearly for them. But it is also challenging to use these in clinical trials to be one of those first members when you don't know what the agency expects to see in terms of, you know, level of validation, what is fit for purpose, what evidence generation, you know, needs to be done before you use these, maybe to select patients or pre-screening. So I do agree completely with what Brandon said that that's why a lot of this work in the pre-competitive space is so important because we can maybe work together on that. And I think this paper is a really great start toward that. But we will also ultimately need more clear guidance or guidelines from regulators on their current thinking so that we know how to get the tool ready for use. Great, thank you. The white paper heavily emphasizes the need for transparency in algorithm development and validation. What steps can be taken to promote and achieve more transparency? And along with that, what are the challenges you see towards that end? Um, I'll start with Martin and then we'll move to Mike and Brandon as well for this question. Martin? Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting challenge, I think, in digital authority. Yeah, I, to me, the the opportunities or maybe the, the challenges for transparency fall into uh into quality questions and standardization questions so for instance on the images side we know that interoperability is not really quite the other that in digital pathology treats to challenges in um <clears throat> in generalization from one one platform to another from one like lab procedure to another in terms of the images that they generate as results so i think we need a bit better uh, standardization and even like quantification and measurement of um, of even just image quality metrics that will then allow algorithm developers to define uh, the range of parameters under which an, the developed algorithms are actually eligible. Uh, so that's really stuff like uh, quality assurance, quality control, uh, defining, and we alluded to that in the white paper, obviously, um, what metrics even to look at. So that's on the pixel side, where there's still, I think, quite a bit to be done, but we also had seen quite a bit of good progress in the last few years. Label quality, when it comes to machine learning, is obviously always um, like a critical component. And I think in digital pathology in particular, given that many labels are subjective, um, is very challenging. And to me, when I look at publications, one of the things that, that stands out is how much work have researchers put into the label quality and in transparency about the quality. Is it IHC derived? Is it derived from a single pathologist versus multiple pathologists? Uh, in the latter case, does it take adjudication into account or just consensus? So I think a lot of um, focus should be played on, should be put on the quality and really the fit for purpose of the data for models. Um, and steps towards that uh, would be, in my opinion, um, TCJ is a good example. I think TCJ has benefited uh, the community is a lot by providing a data set that is annotated, has some form of labels, um, and has, you know, is, is accessible to everybody and can be a benchmark. It's not perfect, but I think it's actually a really great step for moving the field forward. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I won't add too much to that. I mean, I think uh, I, I, that's a great answer. I do think that the white paper sort of outlined a lot of um, a lot of the types of uh, things that we would want to see in our model development that we can expose and, and all sort of align on. It, certainly, it's very difficult. This is going to be a reoccurring theme, I think, in this discussion. It's very difficult to align on standards. There are standards that do exist in our industry. I know the working group 26 did a lot of work in DICOM to create standards around the imaging and metadata associated with it. Not everybody uses it, and you, you have to have a need uh, to have that and there has to be somewhat of a pull uh, for that and and I think pre-competitive consortiums can really help us do that. We also saw that in the past with um, the technical performance guidance document that the agency put out around whole site imaging and, and in fact some of the authors on this paper 
were authors of that guidance. Uh, and in that, you can see that they outline very clearly some of the transparent um, uh, types of information that you need to understand about whole site imaging systems. We don't have that, I think, for uh, the broader computational and AI space. And it's something that uh, this white paper, I think, accurately is, is highlighting that we will need to do. And we'll need to do the heavy lifting as an industry to sort of come together and try to work through uh, what should those standards be uh, that we're reporting uh, for our models. So, so I'll pass it to Brandon and see if him if he agrees with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, generally I do. And, um, you know, the challenge is that most of the engagements with the FDA is one sponsor to the FDA, that bilateral engagement, um, which is why consortia, professional societies and, 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 and patient advocacy groups like Friends are, are a way to really bring together larger groups. Um, you know, these groups have lots of different perspectives and expertise that can contribute to formulating proposals and strategies for what can uh, can be included in a drug development um, process or even just the clinical study side of things and 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 having all those different perspectives you know increases the success of any undertaking so um, i think more people in that pre-competitive space and then engaging with the fda um, I want to I want to give a shout out to that discussion paper that the FDA wrote on using artificial intelligence and machine learning in drug development and um, and make sure everybody knows that there's a page filled with ways to engage with the FDA um, and and I know these these engagement pathways are challenging sometimes and and seeing it through to all the way to the end um, you really have to persevere and and have the endpoint uh, as the target and stay with it uh, until you get there because that's what is will really help the community uh, benefit from the discussion and the more that that discussion is um, shared the more the results are shared from that discussion you know will really help all raise all boats as they say and um and also having those sorts of engagements come from a larger group. But, you know, the FDA recognizes the, the strength in numbers. And when we have a, a larger community coming to us saying the same thing um, or working together to come to a, a strategy that's uh, uh, for the future, I, I think that carries a lot of weight. Great. So to speak to the agency early, often, pre-competitively and with a lot of tenacity. <laughs> so next question, um, an important component to the white paper is a risk classification framework to both assess and mitigate possible risks and help to guide the evidentiary needs. Megan, can you please give a high level overview of this proposed risk classification framework and your thoughts on it and then we'll move to both Mike and Joe for uh, some comments on implementation. Sure, no problem. So in the paper, we applied FDA's existing risk classification scheme for medical devices and also their current thinking on use of digital health technologies in clinical trials from the recent draft guidance because those two are already applicable to these tools. So we used those to propose what we think are reasonable regulatory pathways and controls for, you know, quote unquote, future use cases of digital pathology tools. The things we're talking about that stakeholders are pursuing right now, you know, pre-screening or companion diagnostic use or largely automated systems that have some clinician oversight. And then we also proposed what we thought were reasonable approaches to validation for some of these use cases. But I think as Carl alluded to in his talk, we don't have much in the way of examples of previously cleared or approved products for these newer use cases uh, for digital pathology. There's a lack of approvals for companion diagnostic indications, for example, that would allow sponsors to learn what FDA would expect to see in terms of validation methods. So it obviously, I think was said earlier, it'd be helpful to have a better sense of some learnings from some of these maybe FDA sponsor interactions. Um, and I think also one of the things we recognized when we were going through the framework, and, and Mike, I think, alluded to this, was the whole slide imaging guidance is really helpful, but we also need sort of, as I mentioned, additional future guidance on how to perform 
fit for purpose validation of digital pathology algorithms? And what are the appropriate regulatory pathways and controls for these future use cases that we identified in the paper? You know, we put forward what we thought was reasonable, but ultimately it would be helpful, you know, as we get some of these going through the regulatory process to hear the agency's thoughts on that. Um, and we also, in kind of doing this risk framework, we talked about how, based on sort of the, the approach to use of DHTs in clinical trials, that clinical trial sponsors should demonstrate that digital pathology tools are fit for purpose for the use in the trial. But that also means that the level of evidence and validation should be based on the use case and the risk of that you know, potential use in the trial. So we, we highlighted, uh, highlighted some examples. So for example, digital pathology tools used for pre-screening, if it's being confirmed by another medically established method or to enrich for biomarker positive patient enrollment, that may not require testing that's as robust as a tool that would be used as the sole method for selecting participants for a trial or a treatment arm. So we kind of tried to say, here's the lay of the land in terms of what's been done already. Here's what we think would be a reasonable approach for some of these future use cases, while pointing out that evidence generation also needs to be fit for purpose and based on the risk and the use case. And I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add to that. Oh my God, Megan, that was such a great answer. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to take too much time on that, but I, I do think that the, we do highlight this. I think the fit for purpose, as you're saying, is a particular challenge in the drug development space. I, I do think when we're talking about regulated devices, medical devices, and we we will have some precedent and we can we can point to some areas there where understanding the performance criteria and we can have direct uh, discussions with the agencies. When we get into these fit for purpose, as I was talking about earlier, pharmacodynamics or exploratory biomarkers or pre-screening that has no intention of going to a regulated path as a medical device, there is a tremendous struggle in the industry. And what we will see is pharma kind of having this analysis paralysis. And then in light of or short of any other guidances, they will default to what they have available, which is oftentimes a very stringent guidance or pathway that is medical device. And, and so I, what I what I would encourage people to do, I think, uh, is to try to create their own uh, risk frameworks within their own companies in many ways to try to implement their own fit for purpose strategies, something at least that they can kind of hang their hat on and say, this is what we think would be uh, good in terms of our current situations, but that will only take us so far. I still think, again, we have to do the heavy listing as an industry and sort of try to get some of these things down on paper and create guidances um, so that we, uh, we can all point to that. So um, super important topic. And all we were really able to do in the white paper was just bring it up uh, and, and highlight these uh, you know, important issues. So, so I'll pass it to Joe too, as well on this. Thank you, Mike. Um, let me take a slightly different position. So the risk classification framework as it's outlined is great. However, it, it may not necessarily directly apply to clinical practice or at least not immediately. And let me try to explain uh, why I say that. So to assess the risk of something, you have to define the tool. When you define the tool in regulatory terms, you have to define the intended use. But if we take, for example, a slide, here's one with a biopsy. At the time that we look at this slide initially, we don't know if it's cancer. So the tool would then be a cancer identification tool, for example, simply to say, is it there, yes or no? But once it's there, it suddenly turns into a typing tool where you have to say what type of cancer it is. Once you know what type of cancer it is, let's say lung cancer, it turns into a, is the purity enough for genotyping tools? So then the quantification becomes a little more complex. Now, leaving this simple example, we can say grading and counting or integration of multiple findings, let's say multiple immunohistochemistry um, um, individual tests, suddenly all converge into a final diagnosis, which is to some the highest complexity. However, when considering some of these amazing tools, we can talk about prediction across modalities, not only within pathology, but other imaging modalities and or even predict outcomes. So that poses, of course, enormous regulatory challenges. In clinical practice uh, nowadays, assessing the specific risk level of a microscope in its purest form um, is very high. So in other words, um, I think the flexibility of this tool here, the microscope, exceeds um, this framework when it comes to day-to-day -day practical operations. Nonetheless, this is a fantastic start point for specific questions in the drug development space, 
but whether that can be immediately translated into clinical practice uh, remains to be determined. And I think we're looking for some great use cases to test this out and, and explore whether what we learned during this drug development project, whether that can help uh, move digital pathology forward in clinical practice. Back to you, Kimri. Thanks, Joe. Really important point to make about the fit for purpose difference between for drug development and getting through the approval process versus where the rubber hits the roll, road in, in real world practice. So thank you for, for your, your thoughts on that. So our, our last question, we're just going to go around the, the, the panel quickly and ask you each very briefly, um, what do you each see as important next steps to advance the field and support the use of computational pathology in oncology drug development. And I'll start with Martin because we haven't heard from him in a while. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kimri. I, I would actually follow up directly on what Joe was saying. Um, I, I think we have a bit of a chicken egg problem in digital pathology that in order to bring computation and AI into it, we have to be digital. And uh, I think most people here, definitely myself, are not very happy with the speed of adoption of digital pathology. We know it's moving forward. COVID has been an you know, accelerator, obviously, as well. But it's still a very, very high adoption barrier for technical reasons, for workflow integration reasons, for economic reasons. Um, I, I think the biggest delta we can make in advancing the entire field, aside from technical advance in different like you know, small areas, is to lower the integration barrier, to show more of the benefit that digital pathology has, both for drug development, but also in the clinic, by focusing on on um, on evidence generation for workflow efficiency for better outcomes and really move more of the world towards digital have better integration thereby have better data more labeled data that will in, advance the entire field and I think that's the, the the how we can break or need to break this this chicken egg problem. Great, I'm doing the random draw here. Mike, how about you next? Yeah, I think so. Again, we talked quite a bit about this. I, I do think that, uh, you know, pre-competitive consortiums and getting groups together to sort of uh, start to lay out some some standards. I mean, generally speaking, taking a step back, I do think that in a drug development space, I do think that pharma in general needs to get a little bit more comfortable with the technology and push this more into their development programs. I think this is why it's so great that Friends of Cancer Research has stepped up and created this. But hopefully this is really just the beginning between CEDAR, CDRH, Friends, uh, uh, Precision Medicine Coalition, FNIH, the Digital Pathology Association. There are many groups out there sort of working in similar spaces that I think if we can pull them together and we can start to put on the table some of these thornier issues around transparency and standardization and guidance uh, around performance and fit for purpose, I do think that this will certainly help move um, the field forward. And I think that there's a lot of interest and energy um, right now to, to be um, pushing on those things. So, so I'll stop there. Okay. Brandon? Uh, yeah, so as a device reviewer, I, I really want to understand better the relationship between the what, what I think the white paper refers to as the input parameters, you know, the slide preparation, um, and the scanning parameters, and what do those parameters, how, how do they impact model performance, or even just pathologist performance, uh, ultimately, because the better we can understand that relationship, um, the, maybe we can focus our attentions on where we really need to, rather than have to study all of them, because right now, without that kind of information, you know, the FDA is going to want to see um, evidence that the model works across a lot of those parameters, if not all. So, um, and, and I'd love to see a demonstration project that, uh, you know, kind of comprehensively explores those model parameters, those scanning and, and slide preparation parameters, and sees how they impact not just the preference of uh, whether the image looks good or is di of diagnostic quality, you know, the so-called Likert scale, but actual in a task where performance can be measured and we can see the performance characteristics as we change some of those parameters for the model and the human to really identify where, um, where the performance falls off and where we really need to um, focus our energy and, and make submissions maybe not so all comprehensive, but more targeted. Thanks, Brandon. We'll go to Joe next. Uh, 
Thank you, Kimri. Um, I'd like to pick up what Brandon just said. I think what it, what it comes down to to move this forward is that we have so-called uh, representative data, and that's to me the most paramount issue. So represent, representative in this context means that they're available for validation or performance assessment, uh, but that they that this data that's representative is also um, showing the same or reflect the same diversity of real world clinical scenarios that entails some of the challenging settings. And just to ensure that we can deliver the results that we want in a reliable fashion. So very concrete for a drug developer, this availability of this digital data means you could potentially share, let's say after the approval, your biomarker signature data, that data set for all the people that you want that test to roll out as a ground truth that you can measure your own tool against. That is something that's currently, unfortunately, not available yet. So my key point here is representative data. And Megan, you get the last word. <laughs> Sure. Well, I think it'll surprise no one that I think we do need formal guidance from regulatory bodies to set regulatory expectations and help us establish performance metrics for these tools in drug development. Recognizing, as we've all said, that a lot needs to be done yet in the pre-competitive space, but any clarity I think we can get in the regulatory expectation for use of digital pathology in clinical trials would be really valuable because you know, if we know a little bit more about the evidence needed to demonstrate a tool is fit for purpose for certain use cases or the quality and design principles to apply when, you know, developers are developing these tools, then we can actually use them in our clinical trials more frequently, and that will generate additional evidence to support their utility. Um, but one last point, you know, we also, as we understand it, there's also some hurdles to integrating digital pathology into the standard clinical workflow, and Joe would be able to probably comment on this better than I, but as we understand it, there's not a lot of incentive to digitize these things right now. So even mapping out how to implement digital pathology and routine clinical practice, you know, I think would be helpful. Great. So we um, can next turn, we got some questions in from the audience, and I'm going to read off the first one. The, um, the, the question is, can the panelists touch on the idea of the appropriate evaluation metrics for accuracy of AI, such as sensitivity, specificity? AI scientists might not know the appropriate metrics and the pathologists might not know either. Martin, I'm gonna give that one to you. Yeah, I love that question. Uh, I think the super important point really. Um, so, I think AI scientists are typically used to thinking and publishing in AUCs, areas under the curve, which is pretty much a relatively generic uh, measure of the performance of machine learning model that is often used uh, you know, in, across disciplines and particularly outside of healthcare. It's, it's often quite useful. Um, what I think is super important though is to translate any kind of metrics that is in the abstract used for model training to the downstream impact it has. And, that's where I think we really need to look at the, the integration into the workflow and the consequences of the modelist prediction, and then to focus on metrics like sensitivity, specificity, um, enrichment ratio, for instance, also, and, and really look at the, uh, the right metric and also the right trade-off between the metrics. So, for instance, when we make trade-offs between specificity and sensitivity, that really needs to be discussed in the context of, uh, in case of a clinical decision support system, for instance, what is the consequence of a false positive versus the consequence of a false negative? When it comes to screening, for instance, there are economic considerations also towards the cost of a false positive versus false negative, um, over testing, et cetera. So it really boils down to the exact application and the exact consequences of, of those trade-offs. Uh, the best advice I can give there is this needs to be figured out cross-functionally. And I think the, the question, I already had the answer almost in it, uh, often AI scientists don't know the answer, pathologists don't know the answer. Uh, you have to bring them together. And that's, to me, in, in my career in this in this field, that's what I've been seeing as the number one recipe for success. Bring those people together, have them sit by side by side and make each one understand and learn from the other and then come to the best of worth words to understand what metrics we should be using. Great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Brandon, do you want to add to that as well? Yeah, that's uh, this is my this is my comfort zone. This is what I spend all my time on is evaluating the performance of devices. 
Um, and I think, you know, the binary task, sensitivity and specificity play a big role, is pretty well understood. Um, that's not really the most challenging place. And um, but what is missing a little bit is the impact of how these tools affect the end users. So uh, the, the studies that I see, especially in the radiology space, um, actually study the performance of the device in the hands of the end user. And, um, and, and because that's who has to make those interpretations uh, and make the decisions and uh, on, on the uh, patient report. Uh, and um, that's where the, the clinician variability, pathologist variability, plays a big role and accounting for that variability is important. So we always think about three things. First of all, acknowledge that there's reader variability. The next thing, do everything you can to reduce that with training and, and, and instructions on interpretation. And the last thing is you have to account for that variability in your studies. So uh, I think that's important as an end user group, but also in establishing the reference standard. And that's where maybe some extra effort could happen in this space is uh, methods to assess performance where you account for the variability in the reference standard pathologists when pathologists are used. A little bit more on where things could use more effort also is in not the binary task, but quantitative tasks. I think um, uh, the metrics for quantitation uh, are, are a little less um, robust and certainly do not have the um, methodology of accounting for reader variability. Um, and then the last piece I think this community really would appreciate, I, I hear it over and over again, is knowing the study that evaluated the performance. Um, that means what are the data sets that went into training? What are the data sets that went into testing? What was that patient population? What acquisition systems were used? Um, what slide preparations were part of that protocol? Those inf that information really gives an end user comfort, hey, this might work in my setting, this might work for my patients. And so uh, a little bit more better uh, summaries of those studies for the end users, I think um, uh, there could be a lot of uh, progress made. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what will it take for pharma to adopt digital or quantitative pathology in a phase three trial? We'll hear from Megan and Mike on this one. Sure, Kim Marie. And I think there are companies that are trying to do that. Um, I think what we have to keep in mind is when we're assigning patients to a novel or you know investigational therapy in a phase three trial, let's say it's a targeted therapy, there's an expectation that patients with that target might respond, but patients without that target likely wouldn't. And so we, or could be assigned, you know, if they're screened out to a potentially, you know, cytotoxic therapy with significant side effects. So we need to feel really confident that what we are using to screen patients into a trial is accurate and reliable and that we are not potentially, you know, um, assigning patients to an incorrect treatment arm or, you know, leaving patients out of the trial that could be eligible. So obviously we need to feel that the tool is really robust and well-validated. I think there are people, as I said, trying to do this right now. I think it's easier to use these tools at this point in time for sort of pre-screening purposes, because again, we know the pathway to show that, let's say, a companion diagnostic in under development is analytically validated and ready for use in a phase three trial. The studies we need to have, you know, make sure have been conducted are very clear, and we know, okay, we can feel confident that this tool is you know, reliable for this use if X, Y, Z has been done. We don't necessarily have as much of that in the digital pathology space. So that's why I say, I think it, we will need to have a better sense of what is, an, what is indicative of a tool that is robust, reliable, and well-validated so that we can feel confident we're assigning patients correctly. Okay, fantastic. I completely agree with that. This is a great question. Uh, and um, a few things I think it would take. Uh, one, compelling data. So we, this is not uh, digital pathology is no different than any other technology in pharma. Uh, when we saw PDL one come out and TMB and now CTDNA, typically you're seeing exploratory data, and that data needs to be compelling. And typically, hopefully, in multiple cohorts. Uh, it was rare that you saw an interesting signal exploratory cohort and then jumped right into a phase three with that. So I do think that 
uh, pharma needs to continually uh, embrace at scale and look at, at novel biomarkers uh, and approaches across trials. That's one. The other thing too, I think pharma really wants to see, um, the, and I'm assuming that we're talking about patient selection stratification in, in, in this question, it might not be true, but I'm thinking that for registrational phase three, uh, is the commercial adoption. Uh, there's always very risky for a pharma company to invest in a technology that they can't uh, provide access to overnight. Um, and I will say, and I will caution, I think people that we've seen, as Carl indicated in his talk, there's been this a couple of advances just over the past few years that have really increased the adoption of digital pathology. So anybody who has a feeling about how it was five years ago might not be true today, um, number one. And the other thing too, I would say is pressure test the assumption that every pathology lab needs to have the technology in order for this to be adopted. That, that's not necessarily true. pdl one testing is quite centralized. And of course, NGS testing is very centralized. And, and yet we still are, are moving towards those technologies. So there, there are, are approaches there. And then the last thing I would say is it's going to take probably a little bit of creativity also on the pharma's part and innovative thinking, talking directly with CEDAR, figuring out exactly if they'd be comfortable. We're seeing this now with ctDNA and tumor DNA, where we're seeing either or strategies on patient enrollment, either ctDNA or tumor DNA. And they seem to have come to agreements with the agencies about how can they uh, progress ctDNA and along with tumor DNA in the same trials. And I think that we need to, as an industry, start to sort of be willing to engage uh, in those types of conversations as well at the, at the regulated uh, level. So, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Good question and great, yeah. great responses. Um, I think we have time for only one more question and let's see if we can keep brief answers maybe um the paucity of pathology specific foundational models for histology image feature extraction is a bottleneck for ai and pathology does the panel have any suggestions for how to create these in industry perhaps a consortium effort um joe want to take this one yeah i think uh Maybe briefly, foundation AI model are designed, of course, to produce a, a wide and, and general variety of, of outputs. So the idea would be, hopefully, or at least if I understood the question correctly, things that Martin mentioned earlier, like TCGA or the image data commons by NIH or other grant challenges to create data sets that are fit for purpose, but not only for one purpose, but for many. I'm not aware of, of any currently existing but I know of at least two um, consortia that work on creation of such uh, real world data with a, with a variety of you know, full pathology annotations. But that takes, of course, a lot of effort. Um, I think it requires some governance structure and there are some solutions out there. Thank you. Well, I think we are at time for our Q&A questions. I wanna thank the panel for being here today. You all were excellent. Um, you provided such thoughtful comments. Uh, I also would like to thank our audience for your attendance and your kind attention. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jeff to close us out. Thanks, Kamari. Uh, and many thanks to you for moderating the session and for everyone on the panel for participating today. As we wrap up today's discussion, I want to very much thank all of our working group members for helping to move these conversations forward. In the coming weeks, we'll be building on today's discussion to explore opportunities toward validating the use of computational pathology tools, including as part of a public forum on the future of diagnostic testing that we'll be hosting in February. In the meantime, as we continue with our fall meetings at Friends, this year our annual meeting will take place on Tuesday, November 14th here in Washington, D.C. Additional information, including registration details, are available currently on our website. So on behalf of everyone at Friends, thank you all for joining us today. I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thank you.